going to present this talk about uh, hardware reverse engineering insights from the main project. Uh, I gotta tell you that I am not speaking on behalf of the main project. I am not um, a developer in the core development team of MAME. Uh, this is a very old project. It's 20 years old now, uh, almost, I think 19 years old. Uh, and I've been aware of it for a decade, but I've been closely watching the development for the last five years and actually submitting patches and contributing code to the project for two and a half years, sort of. Uh, but it's not, uh, I'm not a, an official member of the team. I don't speak on behalf of them. All of the ideas here are my own. Um, a really quick uh, view of my past. My, uh, uh, well, yeah, there is a similar talk, similar to this one, not exactly the same, but it's in Portuguese. This is the first time I'm talking about it in, in, in English. Uh, but if you understand Portuguese, you can take a look or see the slides. <laughs> Um, my very, very briefly, my background in software uh, freedom projects is that in 2007 I started working as a core developer in Inkscape. Uh, I also in 2010 uh, co-started, uh, co co-developed the GNU Liberty WG project, which involves a little bit of reverse engineering, but actually the reverse engineering part, uh, which was software and data format uh, reverse engineering, was focused on um, on the, the, the file format for uh, Autodesk secret file format for CAD programs, and uh, it was done by someone else. So I was not involved in the re reverse engineering, but only on implementing things based on a specification. Um, I also started the first hackerspace in uh, Brazil, uh, Garoa Hacker Club. So that, that shows a little bit of my involvement in hardware hacking. Uh, and in 2012, I started my own company to produce 3D printers with uh, fully free uh, firmware and uh, software and hardware. <laughs> Actually, the, the case uh, of the whole shape of the machine is algorithmically generated with, with OpenSCAD, which is also free software. And uh, in 2015, I worked for this company, uh, Kickstarter project. Uh, I worked mostly on hardware design designing the PCB, the circuitry for, for this pedal uh, effects uh, board for, for guitars. And nowadays I'm professionally working with typography tools. So it brings back the idea of working with graphics and you know, that's another thing that I like. Okay, so uh, this talk is about reverse engineering insights from the main project. So what is the main project? Probably some of you know. Um, it's and, and also it's uh, recently become a free software project uh, because it's been like for 20, almost 20 years uh, being developed collaboratively but not strictly as a free software project because there were some uh, restrictions in the licensing scheme that were, was MAME specific uh, but that forbid, for, for instance, uh, commercial uh, usage of the code base. Uh, even though lots of uh, procedures in development were similar to what we see in proper uh, free software projects. It only became a proper free software project very recently. Uh, in the past uh, couple of years that I've been uh, participating as an external collaborator, uh, I made the effort to provide all my patches under uh, duo license that said it's okay to use under this uh, non-free license that you use, but I am also pre-authorizing to use the GPL version 2 or later if you ever change your mind. Uh, I was not involved actively in the transition to free licenses, but it happened uh, during the last eight months where people were contacted and they got authorization from all, all of the major contributors. There were some slight uh, pieces of code that were removed from the code base because uh, uh, original developers or copyright holders would not be easy to find, but it was minor. So right now, um, it's been actually, I think, not, not much more than one week ago that it was properly finished, the, the process. So it's now a free software project. So MAME is an emulator, not only one emulator, but a, a tool chain for creating emulators. So there's like thousands and thousands of emulators in one thing. Uh, it's very much a framework for creating emulation. Uh, for, for creating emulators. Um, and originally there, there was, folk, it was focused on um, 
the 80s arcade games like Pac-Man. I think Pac-Man was probably the first, uh, one of the first uh, drive, uh, one of the first machines to be emulated uh, in what became uh, MAME. Uh, but uh, with the time, uh, people figure out that if you're emulating things in a modular way, you can reuse that code base to emulate other stuff uh, that are not arcade games. So one, one of the goals of the main project uh, is uh, to preserve the history of arcade gaming hardware. Uh, so as these boards are getting uh, destroyed and lost or getting rotten, and you know, th things get old, and if you do not preserve that piece of hardware properly, it will stop functioning or, or even uh, stop functioning due to some design decisions uh, like uh, Capcom, for instance, had the uh, w what we usually call the suicide battery, which is like a battery that holds a static RAM memory inside of a uh, of a processor that holds a cryptography key to decrypt the ROMs of a board, so that it avoids uh, copying. And so, uh, after like 15 years, you, the, the the battery will die for sure, and then you lose your static RAM and then you lose the keys, it doesn't work anymore. So uh, these are some menaces to the preservation of these uh, devices and, and games. Um, but also people figure out that they could emulate other stuff uh, with the same code base. So this is not, an, not anymore a, a separate project, but a, a f for some time, MASS was a secondary or a second project based on the main source code, but emulating anything that was not an arcade uh, machine. So even um, uh, both uh, consoles, which are not properly arcade, but also old computers and also all, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I, I usually joke that you could potentially emulate a microwave oven. Uh, I think it has not happened yet, uh, even though I do have a chip of um, uh, EEPROM uh, uh, with the code of, of one of these. So I, I plan to maybe someday do it just for fun uh, so that the, the, the joke is uh, re a reality, right? Uh, so these two projects got merged into one thing recently. So nowadays, uh, when we say MAME, we say not, not anymore multi-arcade machine emulator. Uh, no one came up with a, an official uh, backronym. Uh, there are some unofficial backronyms like uh, multiple archaic machines emulator because it's not, not only for arcades anymore. And both things are one thing called MAME now. Um, but also I, I like to talk about Linux Libre, which is uh, probably most of you know due to the characteristics of this event. Uh, but for the record, for anyone watching who may not be aware, uh, Linux Libre is uh, um, a project based on the uh, vanilla Linux kernel, uh, but re uh, removing all of the proprietary firmware uh, loading and all of the non-free portions of the source code. Uh, so it, it's maintained by, by a friend. I, oh, actually, I'm Brazilian, and uh, Alexandre Oliva, a Brazilian friend as well, is uh, the maintainer of this project, and we very often talk to each other. We're, we're close friends. Um, so it's, it's a very important project, and it, it fits a need for a fully free kernel. Uh, but there's also the concern that whenever you remove functionality from the kernel, you remove fun functionality, right? Th things don't work anymore. Uh, so we would like to see a, 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 a circumstance uh, where we can have the hardware working again. Uh, and there's some strategies uh, for freedom in that sense. Um, I actually made a list of all of those because I wanted to understand which are the devices that are not working when we use uh, Linux Libre, when we get rid of the non-free portions. So I made a, a, a whole list based on the Linux Libre deblobbing uh, log, and I placed it on the Libre Planet wiki. And it's been a long time ago. Uh, recently I updated it, but, but a rough idea is that there's around three, 300 different devices that require uh, non-free firmware. Uh, and when I say firmware, I mean not 
with the sense of the wireless uh, routers uh, firmware because typically this, this term is used for wireless routers as the full operating system image. But I, I, I really refer to firmware as in the piece of software that runs in the secondary CPU that is inside of the peripheral, not in your main system, uh, not, not, not code that runs in your kernel, but code that runs in the device itself. Um, so one of the strategies is just buy new hardware, right? If, if your hardware does not work, you buy something else. It is okay, but it's not the best thing. Uh, we would like to have power over the hardware, whatever it is. Whatever the hardware I have, I would like to control it. So just giving up and buying something else is uh, not really good, even though it works. Yeah, it's annoying. Uh, a second strategy is to extract the source code of firmware that is released under the GPL. There's been this situation where uh, perhaps uh, trying to deal with the issue of is, is firmware part of the kernel source code or is it something separate? So lawyers were in a battle to understand what, what is a, der a derivative work, what is not, and uh, what is covered by the GPL license in the kernel and what is not. And so apparently the, the big companies uh, decided that it is not a violation to bundle a piece of firmware in, together with the kernel. Uh, so they, they did, did not provide source code. But uh, apparently in several cases, uh, the firmware binaries without source code were released under the GPL version 2. So this is something that we can uh, leverage. We, we can just disassemble that and whatever source code that we get, even though it's bad because we, we won't have variable names, we won't have, we, we, we will only have memory locations, right? But then with a little bit of effort, we can have some insight on what that code does and we can shape that into proper source code. And then that, that may be easier than simply starting from, from scratch. So that, that's one of the strategies. And making a list uh, is important because of that. Uh, if you look there, I have no idea what that device is, but uh, I know that that device was released under GPL version two or later, and there's proof there. It's a file in a repository, the binary in a repository packed together with the license. Um, uh, another thing that we have to know is what is the CPU that runs that firmware? So in this case, I could figure out it was an 8051 uh, microcontroller, but it could be something else. So it's not very easy to figure out what is the CPU. Sometimes you can see some clues. Right? Oh, this is an example. Uh, there was a, a USB serial device that was in that list and it got um, a GPL binaries. So I, I, oh, actually this one was different, this one, actually had full, full free so, uh, source code in assembly language uh, that was available. Um, so this, this is a different case, sorry. Uh, this, this uh, we, we got the source code. But then I tried to assemble that into a binary myself and it did not match perfectly. There was like one bit that was different in the, in the final binary. And this one bit was actually apparently a bug in the tool chain uh, that interpreted differently the one, one of the statements in assembly. So, but as we had documentation on the, on what the 8051 was configuring in that specific register, I could figure out what was that and, um, and actually notice that it, it was wrong. And the, the, the binary that was shipped with the kernel uh, or, or loaded by the kernel for like 10 years was not correct and would not work. It's not that it had a slight bug over there. It, it was a major bug that would make it not work at all. So I thought, well, maybe no one uses this device. So another problem is that if we are going to tackle the issue of reverse engineering binaries to make free form replacement, we got to know which ones are the most important uh, devices. We got to have some kind of um, statistics of usage 
um, ideally among all of the users, maybe among the free software conscious users as a prioritization, as it's more likely to find other people willing to work on those. But we have to have some kind of reference of uh, what is more important. And also we got to ideally uh, build firmware from source as part of the build um, rules in the, in the Linux kernel. Otherwise, code gets out of sync uh, like this. You, you had something being shipped as a binary and both uh, uh, as well as, uh, and both as uh, source code but things did not match. And this one was a slight difference, but there are some other cases where the difference is uh, a bit larger. So it, it gets complicated to see if, if we're using the right thing, if we're loading the, the right thing onto our hardware devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, but this is evidence that there is a user using it. Uh, like someone looking for the firmware and saying, oh, it's very hard to find. And it's free firmware and it's hard to find because it's maybe hidden somewhere on some corner of the internet, right? Not, not, not built into the, the tool chain, uh, the, the build uh, rules. Okay, so another strategy is reverse engineering, but it's time consuming. We are not guaranteed to get good results and there's scarcity of manpower. Also the legal issues, we, we gotta always be sure to to do it in a way that is legal, like be it clean room, reverse engineering. In the case of GPL firmware, we don't need that because it's GPL. But uh, there are cases where the firmware is a piece of proprietary software without a free license. So we, we would do probably have to do something like a clean room approach where one person disassembles it, looks at it, figures out all of the te details, technical details, and then writes it specification for another person to uh, independently develop a new uh, piece of code based on that because facts are not copyrightable. Right? But then the scarcity of manpower highlights the issue that we have to know what should we prioritize. Right? Now, wh why does MAME uh, help here? Uh, how can MAME help? Uh, le le let me just briefly um, explain how the architecture of MAME works and how I think it might be helpful for that kind of quest. Uh, so MAME is very modular. It works by providing a set of emulators for each uh, CPU that is used in some of the boards that it emulates. And there's really a lot of CPUs emulated. Uh, the emulation is not perfect. It's emulated as much as it's needed to make it work. Sometimes people emulate more than necessary, but typically it's, it's, a, it's, it's a question of getting things working. So people apparently tend to emulate the features of the CPU that are used by some of the uh, boards. And it also provides emulators for uh, auxiliary chips like the video chips from several vendors, uh, sound synthesis uh, chips, um, and all sorts of other kinds of chips. So you have these modules, and then the drivers. A driver is a nomenclature uh, in MAME that refers to a piece of code, uh, typically one C++ file, that instantiates these specific uh, uh, emulation modules and connects them together. So it's kind of equivalent to the schematics of a PCB where you said this chip connects to that one in that way with these traces connecting this uh, data bus, address bus, and memory mapping, right? Uh, so it provides a description of the memory map layouts. So which address a range of which CPU or peripheral chip is mapped to each other in what ways. Uh, so it provides the, the, the glue between the chips. Um, mm -hmm. So this is an example. Uh, I, I'm not getting deep here. It's just a couple of slides with some example of code just for you to see how this looks like proper technical documentation, even though it's actual C code with lots of macros. Um, so here you can see uh, one portion of the code describing a game called Gunsmoke. It is a proprietary game. Uh, I gotta say that Everything that MAME emulates is proprietary, except for just a few 
minor exceptions because it's it's about documenting the history of the, of the gaming industry. So it's basically documenting what existed back then. Um, but the hardware aspects are documented as source code. So here it adds a CPU, which is a Z80, uh, manufactured by Zilog in the 80s, uh, very popular CPU, 8-bit CPU. And then there's a program map where there's a, uh, that Gunsmoke map is a data structure describing the, the memory layout, uh, memory mapping. And then there's some interrupt configuration uh, uh, and then the secondary CPU. Uh, so this, we could say this is a dual core system from the 80s. Um, <laughs> even though the, the, the two CPUs have specific purposes, one is just for running the program that controls the playback of music and the other one is for the main uh, logic of the program, the game logic, right? Uh, and then there's the video hardware and uh, sound hardware, and it specifies which sound chip. So in this case, Yamaha 2203 is one of the sound chips. There's another one. Okay, so this is the, uh, an overview of what the hardware does, uh, how, how the, the hardware PCB is built. And then uh, this is the memory map. So it says for each address range, what, what do you have there? So you have ROM or you have a bank switching, uh, ports for input, you know, um, and all sorts of stuff in RAM and so on. But you have the, the address map for both of the CPUs. And then you have also metadata. So this is showing what, what, what you see when you load main. It shows you this uh, summary of metadata. But actually in the source code you have all sorts of other kinds of metadata as well about the hardware. So here you can see it was manufactured by Capcom in 85. And two CPUs of two different clocks and two sound chips and video resolution. Uh, but other than that, there's also a firmware checksum. So for all of those proprietary firmware that were loaded into these machines, even when you had several different uh, releases of the same program, of the same game, um, all of the re releases are documented with checksums. Um, and these, of, of course, these are not uh, shipped by the project. Uh, the project ships only source code with documentation. Uh, for, for actually running an emulator, you've got to have your ROM files. So you've got to have your, your arcade board, you remove the chips from the arcade board, and then you probably use something, something like this. Uh, you, you put the chip into the device, plug to USB, and remove um, and, uh, a dump the contents of the memory chip, and now you have from your board that you own, you have your files that you can run in, in the emulator. And again, this is proprietary files that were in the board, right? So this, this is not sounding good for a free software conference, right? <laughs> yeah, so what I say about this is that, yeah, these are all non-free ROMs, uh, but please don't burn books. It's not because you disagree with the content that you just destroy it. Uh, it's there for historical preservation uh, of something that is culturally relevant. You can look at it as a way of preserving history. And also, all sorts of bare metal software like firmware uh, carry evidences of how the hardware works. So if you think of it as a like uh, digital preservationist perspective, uh, like a uh, it, it, it holds the information in there. It, there's the question of legality, of reading that information, but information is there, or there's evidence of how the hardware works there. So if boards get rotten, you can take a look at that as, as an archaeologist or digital archaeology, right? Uh, it, it can be leveraged in, uh, legally if you follow procedures such as clean room reverse engineering. Now, for, for the Linux kernel and the, the blobs, uh, what we can think of uh, as a strategy based on what we've seen on the main project, is there something that we can do similarly for Linux Libre? For instance, Linux Libre just holds a list of what is forbidden, what is, what is deblobbed. But uh, as, as the kernel evolves, uh, 
this list evolves. But apparently, we don't keep track record of the past releases of different firmware images. So if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to put some effort into reverse engineering this, it is good to have all of the releases of the firmware because you can even compare differences between uh, a, a, a sequence of releases. Uh, if, if you do it legally, it is good to have uh, several different instances of software that used to run on that firmware, uh, of that, on, on that hardware device. So I would suggest that perhaps uh, Linux Libre could use that kind of approach of keeping track of checksums of all available firmware and legal status of every piece because perhaps one version of the binary was released under, uh, under the GPL because of that kind of uh, lawyer stuff, uh, but perhaps some other are not. Uh, so we, we should keep track of all metadata that we can keep track of so that we have all of the knowledge that we can leverage uh, for creating free software uh, substitutes for those. So this is the first procedural consideration that I have. Um, also, I think that we have to broaden the, the, the amount of, uh, the size of the community working with reverse engineering. So yeah, I, I would say that going to hackerspaces and talking to people and Leveraging, leveraging the, the hackerspaces as a strategic lab for, for this kind of stuff is interesting. The maker movement is here uh, with full of young people interested in learning how uh, hardware devices uh, work. There's a, a whole trend on do-it-yourself uh, hardware hacking. So may, maybe we could be aware of this and use that uh, as a way to gather more people into reverse engineering. Right? Um, and also there's the question of once we figure out stuff, where, where do we share the knowledge that we came up with? And how do we collaborate with other people? How do we share this acquired knowledge? Of course, in a, in a legal manner. Um, uh, now I have some examples of devices that I dealt with and that I used MAME in order to get some extra insight on how the device works. Uh, so um, I got this list of all of the non-free firmware, and I was looking at and said, I don't know where to start, but I see something that catches my eye here. I saw something about Yamaha sound, uh, also sound drivers and the corresponding firmware. So yeah, I've been working with also development in, in the, for, for the guitar player uh, pedal hardware device, and I've been looking through uh, emulating stuff using Yamaha sound synthesis chips for several different arcade boards. Perhaps I know something about this. Let, let's see if the knowledge that I have is useful here. So I, I just selected this one out of the blue because of these considerations, right? Um, so it was listed as a non-free firmware in Libre, uh, Linux Libre. Uh, but apparently it is not. Apparently there is source code for the firmware for the Dreamcast sound chip. Uh, so the Dreamcast, the, the Sega uh, console, uh, has got a main CPU, but it's got also a secondary CPU that is uh, responsible for controlling the sound playback, uh, all, all of the sound features. And this secondary um, uh, CPU is uh, typically running a proprietary firmware that is loaded by the Dreamcast uh, BIOS that was developed by, by Sega. So uh, upon boot, the BIOS will load proprietary firmware in there. But then, by looking at the source code of MAME, which emulates the Dreamcast, I could see the memory layout, which, which were the chips and frequencies and all technical details about this. We, we won't have this for everything, but in this specific case, it was useful because it was there. It was already emulated. Um, and then I noticed that it's, uh, the, the, the firmware for the sound chip is loaded into RAM. So there, there's no uh, definitive RAM chip in the device holding a, a definitive version of the firmware. It is all, always has to be loaded from the BIOS or some, or some user program. Uh, someone has to load it at runtime because it's RAM. Um, 
Uh, so this is another aspect that I could see in the main source code. Uh, but then this proprietary BIOS created by Sega was substituted by a free, apparently, it seems, uh, a free uh, firmware developed by the people who ported the Linux uh, project into uh, Dreamcast. So people had the effort to make uh, Dreamcast capable of running Linux. Um, and then they had to implement new free firmware, apparently. Maybe, maybe they could have used the, the already existing one, but for some reason, they developed both the driver, the ALSA driver, and the, uh, and the firmware together. They were doing it, they, they did everything, right? I, I, I don't know the reasons. Uh, I, I did not talk to these people. I'm just supposing that they did it because it was easier to do it that way. Maybe there was some legal requirement, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, so the source code is there, but it's kind of lost in in some dark corner of uh, the internet. Uh, so Linux Libre thought it was uh, non-free and blacklisted it. Um, I tried to build it myself, and I generated a, b a binary image that is not identical to the one uh, that was um, loaded by the kernel. Uh, apparently, there's related to a different version of the toolchain, like from 10 years ago. Not sure exactly which one, so it's hard to replicate. So we really need reproducible builds, including for firmware, so that we are able to know we're building the right thing. Uh, we could validate this by loading this on, on, on the hardware, to, and seeing if it works, or we could load it perhaps in 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 the emulator and to see if, if it work if, if it would work. Uh, but these are things that I have not tried yet. Um, hmm. There's another thing. Uh, I'm running Replicant on my phone, and the camera in the Galaxy uh, Samsung Galaxy S3 does not work. One of them, and the other one works. Uh, supposedly because one uh, runs, uh, does not require firmware or runs for firmware, I don't know. Uh, but the other one for sure requires proprietary firmware. So I thought perhaps we could load this into the emulator and write a skeleton driver, like very quickly, just pull together um, a certain CPU. You may even guess the CPU, right? You guess <coughs> the CPU, you load it there, you make a very quick driver and maybe it's good at that. Uh, as it's modular, it's very easy for you to create a new driver just by putting the pieces together and see if it works. Uh, but then, how do we detect the CPU? Uh, so one of the tricks that I would like to show is that uh, some architectures have like a signature of uh, the, the values of the opcodes. So if, if you get an ARM chip, uh, the instruction set uh, is mapped to <coughs> opcode values, and these values uh, have some fields that says uh, whether or not an instruction is uh, executed. So every instruction in the ARM architecture is, uh, can be conditional. Uh, so you don't have to have loops, uh, like uh, conditional loops. You can make one single instruction decide whether or not it will execute based on the flags. And it's configurable for all, configurable for all instructions. So due to these characteristics, you have one field, certain bits that tell you whether it's conditional or unconditional or what kind of condition it's expecting. Uh, and the most common one is unconditional. So the value of the unconditional instruction is very frequent. So if you look at the binary blob and you see that every four bytes you have uh, a certain value, I, I think it's E, E0 or something like that. I, I don't remember the, the value. But if you see that value, you see, oh, this looks like ARM code. I, it, it's a good way to, to show up also. <laughs> like, ah, this is ARM code. But, you know, it's, it's a pattern. And maybe other CPUs also have some similar patterns. And I, I, I think it would be really good if we had a way to share this kind of knowledge. Like, how do we figure out which CPU it is? if we had like a, a pool of knowledge of how to figure it out algorithmically or by observing patterns, it would be awesome. I know this because I've been dealing with this, but it would be cool uh, and important 
to have it centralized in some kind of knowledge base, right? Um, and I open for questions. access. Uh, you can freely download the programming software, but you need to have a dongle in order to use it. Uh, and is this something that hardware hack reverse engineering is be likely to help very much with? Uh, I guess it could help. Um, have you have you taken uh, pictures of the PCB of your device and uh, the one I have I could get some pictures of it. Yeah, um, because then we can figure out which is the CPU if it is, if if it's got uh, an external memory, or if the or if the code is inside of the CPU, and then we can try to see how to extract the original uh, proprietary firmware, and then how to set up in a legal manner a way for us to to disassemble that perhaps, or to look at patterns and see some in, yeah. have some insight on, on how it works, and then we we could write a piece of driver name perhaps to emulate your your wheelchair. Right. And then, or, based on that, we can replicate the behavior of, of it, perhaps. I, I'm always saying perhaps because it's a hard thing to do. But, but we can try, and we have the tools to, to at least try it. Right. It's, uh, you know, either that or figure out a way to, get, to do, uh, undongle of the uh, software. I don't know if that's Yeah, possible. and there's also the possibility of using software sniffers for reading the data that goes through. Um, if you install uh, like a sniffer that is in the in the kernel layer, it can get <coughs> intercept the messages and write a log, and then by observing that log, you can get some insight on what's going on as well. I'm not sure if I know how to do it, but I, I have a rough idea. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah. There's. Uh, I've heard about people in the QEMU EMU project who were working with um, emulating the original BIOS from a computer. And uh, wh whenever the, the emulated BIOS would make a request to read or write um, a register, it would send this through the serial port to the actual hardware. So the actual hardware would run just a really tiny BIOS that the only thing it does is to set up the serial port and to receive remote commands to actually perform the reads and writes in the data bus, in the, in the address bus, so that you, you offload the original BIOS to the emulator and then you intercept that. So you have a log of all of the memory areas you're accessing, writing and reading. And with that log, you can... Uh, have some extra insight on what, what's going on. And, and it's supposedly legal. Supposedly it is legal <laughs> uh, because uh, you're not really disassembling the code yourself. So you, can, you could do it alone probably because a single person uh, would potentially be able to do it legally uh, because you're not really looking at their code. You're just looking at patterns of behavior, just, just facts, just the, the the information that goes through, but not the actual code, which is copyrighted, cop copyrighted, right? But I think I think there's there's a way to do it. But you, you mentioned emulating the dongle. Right. Is that something that's doable? Or is that something? Uh, maybe maybe it is. Um, it, it all depends on what kind of chip is used inside the dongle. What what kind of technology is there, and if we have the information or ways to get it. mentioned and rightfully so many times the legality of reverse engineering. Yeah. For somebody who thinks reverse engineering is cool but knows like nothing about the legal aspects, how do I go or how do we go and learn about this so that we're not, you know, putting ourselves in jeopardy um, uh -huh. to do this? Are, are there specific 
I, yeah, I, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I worry myself about my legal safety, of course, and I try to get informed. But I, I know, I know for, for instance, the EFF is doing good work on uh, giving some, some support. Uh, but, but I, well, I just get informed on these kind of sources. Like, the EFF is a good source of information on that topic. When you're mentioning um, analyzing the behavior of hardware devices, um, the thing that comes to my mind is people having to know how to use a logic analyzer. Um, is is there like a, a lot of work to be done that can be done through like software means? Um, mm. Yeah, it's interesting that the w one of the devices that is partially emulated in MAME is a, is a logic analyzer. I, I don't think it's, it's very useful, but it's, for, you know, it, it can be done. People do it, but it's much more because it's fun, I think. Uh, but yeah, you, you're right. Um, lots of the tools that we use rely on proprietary stuff. So just this, this reader that I just showed you, uh, it's an e, universal EEPROM reader and programmer, and it can also program CPUs and so on. So it, it, all of the knowledge about how it works, it's in its own firmware, and it's proprietary. So I, I'm using a tool because it's the only thing that I have, but I, there, there's some effort to replace that. Um, I'm trying to get a way to replace that, but we, we end up relying on some uh, rogue stuff. <laughs> it's, it's almost unavoidable when you are trying to figure out information. I think it's it's uh, reasonable to resort to some things that are not completely pure in order to get information. You know, it's it's so hidden that we will go to all uh, all, all all means that we have to get information if we do it legally. So I I am really annoyed that some of these things are proprietary, and I would like to have a replacement for them. But it it is a block in my way to get the information. So I end up using it sometimes. Legally, yeah. Uh, like who's gonna, who's yeah. Gonna prosecute, though? The companies that already uh, st still exist in, in operation, like Capcom, or you know, the, there are companies Even that not still they, the they are the owners. They, they are copyright owners, and copyright is insane. <laughs> I don't know if they would. I, I, probably they would, but I, I don't know if if is likely. Um, but they, they can. Uh, they, they have the right in the law. Uh, yep? Well, I mean, copyright in, in, in the United States for corporate is, um, I want to say something like the lifetime of the invention plus 120 years. So as long as someone holds the copyright and they have, you know, the, you know that's their intellectual property, um, if they can, there's a whole period they hold the business That, yeah, that happens often, yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot for all of you.